she came here to Boston to compete in the Olympic trials. She did so on a bad right leg. Gymnast first. Gymnast first. Gymnast first. Nothing, nothing, nothing gets in the way of gymnast first. USA Gymnastics, the number one team in the world. There's a whole institution of people who knew through these years. Get the gold medal, Freddie. I don't know how anyone couldn't have known. Who goes to their doctor's basement? There's a lot on the line. Why on earth did they not report him then? You know, there are many missed opportunities. They knew they needed a better system, and they sat on their hands. This is probably the darkest stain in U.S. Olympic history. Wow. Mr. what have you done? Gymnastics is kind of an interesting sport. You either are or you aren't one. You know, they'll tell you right away if you're, if you're gonna go to the next level. They can see it in you, the way you jump, the way you move. I just always was one. I was perfectly suited for gymnastics. I was tiny, strong, fearless, loved flying, loved little daredevil. It's the most amazing feeling to be able to propel your body through the air and flip around and stick it. It is flying. The feeling of having power, that's like a lot of people don't talk about is like the flying thing comes after the power and feeling that like command over your body and doing stuff that regular people can't do. Now watch this, watch this. Back so be right to the other bar. Has that been done before by never, a girl? Never, not by any human that I know of. Olga in 72, to the American public, they were flabbergasted by what she was able to do. They were enamored by it. Isn't that something? I think the American culture is infatuated with gymnastics because every four years you see these little, strong, wonderful, talented, amazing athletes pop out on the big stage. I don't think that any other Olympic sport in the summertime really gets as many viewers just because it has everything. It has the beauty, it has the power, and the music, and the drama of it. And what a champion. Absolutely superb performance. Faultless. Absolutely faultless. And Ted has gone on the board. That's perfection, and that is Olympic history for Nadia Comaneci. Wanting that Olympic dream, wanting to be the best in the world, you go and you train so hard day in and day out, no matter how bad people are treating you, you go back for more. You know, you go back for more because you want that dream. It's, it's burning inside of you. Elite Olympic gymnasts are typically like 15, 16, 17 years old the peak of their sport. So you have to start young to get good, to be still young and be the best. 
I think that a lot of people think it's easy because they're so cute and they're so bouncy and smiley, but really I don't think there's a sport that's harder in terms of the age where they expect to excel and the demands that the coaches put on them. They think it's mentally difficult and one of the most physically demanding sports. You are going to get hurt and you're not going to complain. It did not matter what happened to you, you were not to cry. There were things like when they would be racked. Racking is just like a torture to these girls. It's trying to force them down into splits. And you've got such adult pressure being put on these little girls. And they are not to cry, they are not to yell out. But yet you know they're in so much pain. But they just do it without complaint. This is the tricky part about our sport. To be great takes so much energy, focus, intense training, training through fatigue, sometimes injury, as long as it's not an injury that's going to be dangerous or debilitating. But sometimes things are, everything hurts. That's, that's the whole thing about being a great gymnast. It's almost like being a wounded animal. You don't show your weakness. You don't show that you're hurt. Safe position. And Gymnastics is not a sport with a lot of back and forth communication. It's a lot of soldier, learning how to be a soldier. These women have to perform so that USA Gymnastics brings in sponsorships, so that US Olympic Committee can be proud of them and trot them out every four years for all of us to watch so that NBC viewers can, you know, it's a money machine. And at the heart of it are teenage girls and their bodies. It seems like an arrangement that's bound to create abuse. The former team doctor for USA Gymnastics for 20 years is facing dozens of accusations of sexual abuse, including one from a former Olympian. One of the women has filed a criminal complaint against Nasser with Michigan police. The other has filed a lawsuit in California. Former Michigan State University and Team USA gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser has been arrested. When I first heard about Nasser, I was completely shocked, and then I totally wasn't shocked at all because he's in exactly the position to get away with this. Like, if you were a child predator, you would become him. It's so perfect. Larry Nasser was a doctor for USA Gymnastics for more than 20 years. He'd worked with Michigan State for just as long. He was a physician at Michigan State University, and then he would be called into camps, these periodic, these monthly camps for the women's national team. And then world championships, major international national team events, he'd be right there. His contract with Michigan State said you have to also do outreach in the community. So he also worked with high schools and local gyms. So literally he had his hands on hundreds of children every year for many years. When Trinae became a level five, we were all invited to a big meeting. And in the meeting they said, 100% of your children will be injured. And then I remember being introduced to Larry as a trainer. And I thought, oh, good, there's a safety net. If they get injured, there's a trainer. I thought we were lucky to have Larry. He was seen as like the guardian angel of the gymnasts. He was all about, you know, protecting the athletes. And that's not something we often hear in the elite space. Not just physically, but mentally, you have to protect your athletes. You have to let them know that we care. You have to not let them know, but let them feel it. Let them understand it. Let them breathe it. It's, it's there, you know? It's not just a pat on the back, you know what I mean? It has to be sincere that we care. Larry Nasser was the good guy in this whole web of people you have to deal with with gymnastics. How could a gymnast not say, wow, this guy is so nice to me. Like, everybody else is so mean. They want me to, to do an extra routine, or my leg hurts, and they want me to keep running or something. He was brilliant at fooling these girls into trusting him. And, and I don't know how he got the Carolis to turn their backs, or maybe he did it behind their back. I'm not sure how much the Carolis knew. I don't know for sure if they knew about him. Did they know that he was alone with gymnasts? 
Yes. Should they have known that was against a policy, that there were policies and procedures in place and he was violating them? Yes. Did they care? No. That gold medal gymnastics coach, Bela Caroli, has yet another winner on his hands. Bela Caroli is the gymnastics coach who brought Nadia Comaneci and Mary Lou Retton to Olympic fame. I'm not concerning about anything else than to be the winner, to win. And I love to win. <laughs> That's the truth. Stronger, 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 stronger. Round it. Yeah. Get your legs more and more out, pressing that. Hit it. And up. That's not good. You're not doing that, I think. Hold that. And press down in. Press. Bella and Marta Caroli are the most famous coaches in gymnastics history. Bella Caroli was the architect of the Romanian dynasty in the late 70s. Bella comes around with Nadia Comaneci and others and becomes the premier global superpower in gymnastics. At the time, the gymnasts were mostly over 20 years old. It was really a women's sport. Bella and Marta changed the concept of gymnastics to train very young children, very intensive training from six years old. He had this philosophy, if you do enough repetition and you stay prepubescent and you don't gain weight, you're going to get those girls to hit. These monthly camps at the Crowley Ranch in Texas were a huge factor in creating this culture that created Larry Nasser. So the Crowley Ranch is located near this little town called New Waverly, Texas, it's like a filling station, as they call them in Texas, and I think, a, I don't even know if they have a stoplight. You get off the freeway, and then you, you're actually in the Sam Houston National Forest, and you're going down this red dirt road, deeper and deeper into this forest. It's like straight out of a movie, and you finally come upon this compound of a gym and a couple, a house and like a dorm, and there's snakes everywhere and bugs, and it's hotter than hell, and it's just this Texan nightmare. The way that the Corollis implemented the system was, we don't want you to lose focus. We want you 100% focused on gymnastics, bond with your team, that's it. No phones, no internet, very controlled. They had things that were written to the athletes that said, while you were at the ranch, you could not go to your personal coach or your parents. Now, is that a little bit weird? You say to somebody, you can't go to your parents? One of the main themes about the Caroli philosophy is athletic Darwinism. There are so many kids out there, the U.S. is so deep now that if you can't hold up physically or if you can't handle it mentally, well, there's somebody dying to get in here who will pay the price. So they knew they could push these kids hard, hard, hard. This kind of like brutal, do a lot of numbers, as many numbers as possible till you do it. Doesn't matter if you're falling flat on your back 5, 10, 15, 20 times. Doesn't matter if you're injured. You, you better not speak up was the whole mentality in the environment. You better not or else we're going to take your Olympic dream away. You're beat up. You have coaches screaming at you, bullying into doing stuff that you're not either ready to do or you're too tired to do. So you put in dangerous situations. And Nasser was the guy he was the positive guy. He's the guy who snuck him food, gave him candy, let him borrow the cell phone. I mean, you talk to all these women who were on the national team were abused by him. They said, you know, he was our friend. If Larry's doing this, it must be okay because he, he was our friend. He was like the one guy we trusted. What was your impression of Larry Nasser? Well, he was a great guy. I mean, I asked him to help my gymnast from my gym. I called him at nighttime, and the next day he helped me, uh, sent me the x-ray, you know. He didn't ask for any payment. When you're around sports for a long time, you see team doctors, and Nasser always kind of struck me as a little bit different from guys in that position in other sports. He kind of seemed not quite up to speed. It's kind of a dopey guy along for the ride. The thing about USA Gymnastics, for all their global success, it's kind of a small-time operation. The people there are there because of the Crowley's blessing that they're not going to rock the boat. Marta liked that Nassar would tow the company line. He would tell them exactly what they wanted to hear. There were girls that got injured, and you want to get a gymnast back? Sure, we can get her back. 
he would just kind of play the game because he wanted the access. He had access to these kids pretty much around the clock. He was doing this all kinds of places, in dorm rooms at the Crowley Ranch, in dorm rooms at the Sydney Olympics, you know, hotel rooms, wherever. The view from the hotel room where we're staying at, at nighttime, the City of Lights, they call this. Just got back from training. It's hard for me to even fathom the fact that, you know, we'd see these gymnasts at these Olympics and they're interviewing with us saying, oh, where I just came back from treatment. Looking back now, my gosh, these girls were coming to talk to us right after they were abused by this doctor who was like always smiley and, you know, uh, looked like oh, everybody's best friend, giving people gifts. He was so sweet. I mean, it's, it's like sexual abuse 101. Grab that. Okay, come back with your backhand, wrap it around. Got it? Come around. Pull down. There you go. Grab with your other hand and pull up. So the athlete can do this themselves. The athlete can learn to do the kinesial tape themselves too, because it's in a sensitive area. I find it hard to look at him as like a criminal, aside from all of the things he did, because that's not, I mean, and I, I don't know. I don't really know another criminal. I don't know another serial child molester. He was so good at being who he was on the other side of that. Like he was, I mean, he was awesome. <laughs> I hate even saying that because it's like, counterintuitive of like, what the heck's happening to us, but he was awesome. <laughs> That's why we all loved him. I would have considered him a friend. Uh, it's very, like when I first heard about it, my immediate reaction wasn't, that's impossible. My immediate reaction was, please don't let it be true. Because this is a man that I trusted. We would sit and talk for hours and he would tell me about what a great philosophy I had and how he loved how I protected children. And, um, you know, all of this stuff that just makes me look back and go, God, what a master manipulator he was. He was a typical serial pedophile. Charming, powerful. He was able to pull the wool over all of the adults' faces. What do you look for in a child sex abuser? And the answer is the nice guy. It's kind of easy for them because they find places where it is easy. A priest, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, a coach, a doctor for the gymnastics team. These girls adored him and trusted him, and that's not just gymnasts. Larry Nasser saw anybody who had a complaint. Gymnasts, rowers, cheerleaders, dancers. He lived three miles from me in Holt, Michigan. It was just like a normal suburb neighborhood. He was a personable, God-fearing Catholic man. He was so involved in the community. He volunteered at the church. He volunteered at the high schools. He was almost everywhere we went, always smiling, charismatic, overly involved in our lives. I was 14, and I wanted to be a doctor. So Larry brought me to take your daughter to work day. We had each other's phone numbers. I would text him almost daily. We are friends on Facebook. He'd post on my wall. He shared his Instagram, so I knew his children's names and faces and his wife. He'd ask about your personal life. He knew about my friendships. He knew what classes I was taking, where I wanted to go to college. He was a friend, a confidant at one time. Nasser was extremely well liked, but he was also admired as someone who was doing amazing things for female gymnasts. Thank you for visiting gymnasticsdoctor.com where you can see over 400 educational videos on how to rehabilitate your gymnast. So the weak glute medius muscle, this drops down, the foot rolls, and she's got the, the weakness in the, in the hip area here. Come off your toes and come back. All in one motion, toes, arms, go. Every appointment, he would have his hands all over me adjusting me, massaging my back. And what some people might not understand that this is a really big part of gymnastics that he took advantage of, that we're used to having adults spotting us, helping us stretch. We're used to having adults touch us. But Larry took it a step further. He explained to my mom, I'm going to put my hands near a very private place on your daughter. He didn't ask, he just said that that's what he was going to do. Larry Nasser pretty much had 
a, a primary method. You would come to him and, I have a backache. I have a hip problem. He would stick his ungloved, unlubricated hand in your vaginal cavity and do what he called a vaginal adjustment. And it was like this catch-all treatment, you know, stuff that was nowhere near your pelvic area. This was like, this will make it better. He told me that I would probably be uncomfortable and kind of explained that in the vagina there's a trigger point or pressure point that would release to help him work on my ankle to be less painful. In my case, I wasn't given a heads up or any kind of explanation about the procedure. I think he just said, tell me if this hurts. Like, which it did, but everything that he was doing hurt. He was doing like pressure points and manipulations and like pushing on my muscles with his elbows. Um, I was pretty used to just like buckling down and taking whatever pain. You're always told by coaches, teachers, no pain, no gain. So when something's painful, you're thinking this is helping me and I'm getting better because of it. I remember being like, can I survive this for another two minutes? Watching the clock on my phone, waiting for five minutes to go past, 10 minutes to go past, up to 45 minutes or an hour. So his appointments would be two hours long. My analysis is an hour was medical, professional, and then the second half was sexual. Trying to remember back, you know, to these treatments and thinking back, and I'm like, how the heck didn't any, like, how did he do that? And then I'm like, I don't think there was a silent moment. I mean, I don't think he ever stopped talking. What's happening today? How's, you know, your family? Oh, Dawn, how's things going with the kids? Mother of three daughters. My goal was to keep them safe. And then I became an accomplice in such a crazy world. I mean, he would talk to the parents while he was doing this. And so it, it was confusing. The first time specifically, uh, well, my dad was in the room and I just, like first I was like, what? Like, is this normal? Like, what is going on? And then a, a little bit of thinking about it, I was like, okay, well, my dad's on the other side of the room, so maybe it's normal. And then I'm like, but does he know what's happening? I don't know if he does. Well, how do I ask about this? I can't ask about this. And then, then you think, well, he's a doctor. I didn't think that it happened to her because I had no idea. Like, I was there. I thought I saw everything. She was with me at every single appointment. Was your mom always with you? Yeah, she was always in the room with me. Having your own parent there and he's still able to manage to get away with what he did, even with someone else in the room. That, that's really scary. This is a grooming behavior. The parent's sitting there, the child's watching the parent. The child doesn't want to tell the parent this is going on, but believes the parent must know because it's happening right in front of them, so it's okay. So guess what happens later on? The parent doesn't come into the next session. And instead of it being a two minute procedure, it ends up being a 45 minute procedure. The young girl thinks it's okay because mom and dad were sitting in the room before. I noticed that what he was doing was getting more aggressive as I got older. And when I could drive myself, then no parent was in the room. So then it really amped up. He would bring us to his house, to the basement. When I heard two months ago that Taylor was treated in his basement, I almost fell over. Who goes to their doctor's basement? He offered free treatments to women all the time in this basement, which I knew about. So that's why I felt okay going, because I once again minimized it. Everyone else goes there too. You know, he would get erections. You know, it's just something's not right there. <laughs> he would take his belt off. He would make grunting noises. And if we look at it as, a, as adults, we're like, Oh my God, didn't you know? Of course this is for a sexual purpose. But you gotta put your mind, a young girl who has no sexual experience, a young girl who's trusting, a young girl who's told repeatedly over, this is the Olympic doctor, he's there to help. So these girls, they had no clue. And then I would feel better after my appointments because like I said, he was doing medical things and no one else was helping me get better. So I knew I had to go back because I needed to be relieved of my pain. So even if I hated the treatment, I would go back. And that's 
how so many girls were abused for so many years. How often was that vaginal treatment? Probably every time. I don't remember not having it. They estimate it happened to me, estimate like eight, maybe 846 times. It's a lot. The reason Larry was such a good doctor was because you didn't feel anything afterward. Not just physically, emotionally, mentally, you had to block it out. You had to, or you're gonna fall apart. These young women didn't know. Their bodies might have known, subconsciously they might have known. They thought this was a legitimate medical treatment. They were told over and over and over again, you can trust Larry. Larry says you can trust Larry. Kathy says you can trust Larry. John Geddard says you can trust Larry. Who is John Geddard? Satan. He is uh, the devil. And he uh, is the head coach and owner of Twistars. Open the hips. That's better feet. Now up, 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 up. That's too much forward. Straight, squeeze it. Shape, hold the shape. Press the landing, press the landing, press. Nice. Stay there, stay. John Geddard, former 2012 Olympic team coach. When I came to Michigan, very, very, very quickly, I realized that John was the force, the name in certainly Region 5 gymnastics. John Getter coached Olympic champion Jordan Weber, and he had many other national team members throughout the years. He housed Nassar at his facility in Michigan, Twist Stars, where he had unprecedented access to his gymnasts in the gym. Like at the Crowley Ranch. Very similar environment, actually probably even more access at Getter's gym. At the ranch, it was only whenever he was able to come into the monthly camps. But at Gettersham, he could go in every day if he wanted to. John especially, Twist Stars especially, sent you to Larry. He came in every Monday, and he would stay until everyone was seen. He was very well known at the gym, obviously, because he was promoted at the gym. He was pretty much like our go-to doctor. Larry knew how to get them back in their sport. He knew how to pick them up psychologically because the last thing you want to be if you are an athlete is injured, especially in John Geddert's gym. John Geddert, super intimidating man, super intimidating. Um, walks it, owns it, talks it. How would I describe myself as a coach? Well, I know how others describe me, but I think they get the wrong impression. Um, I'm pretty intense, very caring about my athletes. Um, I'm not a warm and fuzzy um, blow smoke when it's not needed. I'll give kids their due when they deserve it, but I'm not going to unnecessarily tell them how wonderful they are if they're not being wonderful. He would use more of a tactic like beating you down. So he would belittle you, he would insult you, call you names, and you would feel like you weren't good enough. It was your fault, you were doing things wrong. At gymnastics meets, if a girl fell, I would see him turn his back on her and he wouldn't watch her compete. Or he would throw a water bottle at somebody because they made a mistake on the bars. And so you would keep trying harder and harder to get his approval. You always wanted John's approval and when he gave it to you, it was something special. kind of like the wrong way to do it, but as long as John got results, he continued his, his technique. Just break every single girl down until they thought they were nothing. And then after practice, you'd go and see Larry. He'd be there for you. Be that person that you know is gonna understand you. And for me, he was kind of like a friend that I could go to. Larry was good and John was bad. <laughs> I mean, you knew that they were good friends, but I never, it's weird, cause like, I don't, they're so different. Larry's super dorky and John was super like ego, but it was almost like the weird perfect fit. I think that if we were injured, John sent us to Larry because he would give the shortest amount of time that could be necessary to come back from our injury. And there would be no mediator, I guess, in the middle to, be like, well, maybe she needs this extra few weeks. If Larry thought you were okay, then you must not be hurting anymore, you're okay. 
That sounds dangerous. Yeah, um, I would say so. I started having some shin pain in my leg and then it started getting worse a couple weeks later. And so then I finally said something to John and he said, we'll go see Larry. So I saw Larry, he poked and prodded at it and he says, I don't think anything's seriously wrong with it. Like I'll tape it up a little bit, but you're okay to continue practicing. I kept practicing for weeks later. The pain got worse. It felt like I was stabbing it every time I tumbled. And it got to the point where I was seeing Larry every day at practice. And then after practice, I would go to his house and be in his basement at his house. How often did he do the treatment? Every time. I felt violated, but he's a doctor. It's got to be for some reason. Um, so I just never said anything, and I just kind of accepted it. You would think that if your leg wasn't getting better, you might want to get x-rays on it, but that didn't happen. Doing all gymnastics stuff on it, it was um, excruciating, but a prestigious Olympic doctor is telling you nothing's wrong, so you kind of think you're crazy. I mean, it makes you wonder what really is pain. And the practice before we left for nationals, I was struggling so hard. And so finally I was like, John, like I'm trying my hardest, but my leg hurts so bad I can't make this. And he told me to get my stuff out of the fucking locker room and get out of the fucking gym. He means forever. So I go to the ER, I get x-rays, and it's broken, like splintered. It looks like a nail was hammering down on my leg, and it just kept splintering off pieces because I just kept tumbling on it. Do you think that you were purposely mistreated by Nasser in order to keep you in his care? I think it's definitely a possibility. Why else would I have competed on a broken leg for a month? Why else would x-rays have been in the question if it continued to get worse and not better? Do you think that John Getter knew about Nassar's so-called treatments and that they were not appropriate? Um, it's hard to say, but I don't know how anyone couldn't have known. Um, with be being in a room right there in your own gym, you know? There's no way he didn't know something about Larry. And even if he thought it was really a treatment because this guy was supposed to be his best friend and supposed to be a doctor, it's such a bizarre thing that you would hope that he would at least look into it. And there's no way he didn't hear. We talked about it openly in the gym. There's a whole institution of people who knew through these years and it, it could have been stopped. How do you think the abuse could have stopped earlier? Could have stopped when Kathy was told. Kathy Clegus, another friend of John Getter and Larry Nassar, she was told in, in 97. I went to Spartan Youth Gymnastics Club and one of the head coaches was Kathy Clegus. MSU's head gymnastics coach. I had been thinking about talking to an adult about these treatments because it did make me uncomfortable. So Kathy Clegus had me come into her office and I did specifically tell her that Larry was putting his fingers inside of me. And she just said, I must be misunderstanding. He would never do anything inappropriate. She said she had known him for years and years, and I just must be mistaken. Kathy did not believe her. So she marched other gymnasts in to try to dissuade the rest of that this wasn't happening. She had teammates come in a couple at a time while I was sitting there in her office in front of me, and she asked them if Larry had ever done anything to make them feel uncomfortable during treatments. And all of them said no, except one other girl. So this other girl stayed in the room, and Kathy still just couldn't wrap her head around what we were saying. So she brought in a couple college-age gymnasts, and they would explain, you know, his hands get close to certain areas, but they never are inappropriate. And I, again, I said, well, that's not what is happening to me. His fingers are going inside. Then at that point, they left the room. The other girl left the room. 
Coach Clay just told the other gymnast, you're misinterpreting this, I don't want to hear it, and basically shut her up. But Larissa still stood her ground. I again said what was happening, and she said, well, I could file this, but there's going to be very serious consequences for both you and Larry Nassar, and you need to really think about this. And I just, I think I raised my hands and said, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. That's not my intention. And so I went back out and I think I ran into the bathroom and just cried for the majority of practice. She intimidated her and it shut her down. Coach Clay just then didn't tell her parents, but she did tell one person. She told Larry Nassar. So my next appointment with Larry, he walked in, he closed the door, he sat on his little stool and he said, so I talked to Kathy. And at that point, my heart just sank. I felt so embarrassed. I felt so humiliated. He said, Kathy told me your concerns, and you know I'm doing this to help you. And I remember saying, I'm so sorry. This is all my fault. It's all a big misunderstanding, and I'm sorry. So I just convinced myself that I must be the problem, and I just better suck it up. And then I hopped back up on that table, and he continued to abuse me for the next four years. Adults prefer and protect adults. We say we protect children, but children are second-class citizens. They don't vote, they don't have power, and it's so much easier to let a child's needs go. It's really denial, but it's also they're protecting the adult's livelihood. No one wants to destroy a successful adult's life. And so we put it off and we put it off. Larissa Boyce um, told people who worked for MSU in 1997. Uh, I was three in 1997. You know, that's impactful. I could have been stopped. Kathy Clegas knew that there was a proper process that she should have taken when she told me that she could file something, but she chose not to. And so I absolutely believe that's on MSU. She was their employee. And then all of the other girls who came forward and told trainers or psychiatrists, all of them were at MSU, MSU employees. They did not want to believe a single girl. From 1997 to 2015, there were 17 incidents of reporting just to Michigan State alone. In 2014, Amanda Tomasha, who had attended Michigan State University, filed a Title IX complaint against Larry Nasser, alleging that he had molested her during a treatment session. I told them exactly what happened, that Nasser started to insert his fingers into me, and I p stood up, I pushed him off of me, and he ran to the corner of the room to hide his erection. Michigan State University investigated through their OIE office, Office of Institutional Equities, and they're supposed to be impartial. In that investigation, they allowed Larry Nasser to pick four, quote, independent, cooperating experts of his so-called treatment. Larry said that it was medical. I said that it was sexual assault, and so they asked some of his friends what they thought. Three of the four were his students or colleagues. One was a trainer. He knew all of them. He handpicked all of them with the knowledge of his supervisor, Dean Strample. And what the report finally said was that the young lady misunderstood the nuances. And as a result, they found no violation. They left the direction out of the report. They also left out the fact that I pushed him off of me. I was 24. I knew what was and was not appropriate. They gaslighted me. So this is the surprising thing. Two reports were generated. There was a report generated issued to Amanda Thomas show. And in that report, they say 
They find no violation of the sexual harassment policies. The report ends on page 22. Lo and behold, here we are in civil litigation. You know what we find? There's page 23. Page 23 goes into all the problems that potentially are there. It is opening the university up to liability. They better have a chaperone in place. He better wear gloves. He better have informed consent. And they never turn that report out to anybody. That report's internally kept between Larry, Strample, and the OIE office. The three years surrounding my investigation, my Title IX was the only Title IX that produced two separate conclusions. So Larry Nasser was put on leave 90 days. That's how long the OIE investigation was. But in the end, Dean Strample put in an email, glad to have you back. Please, Larry, just follow these restrictions. Dean Strample put restrictions on Larry Nasser. Simple rules like explain the procedure, wear gloves, have somebody else present in the room. But Dean Strample, he never followed up. We've spoken to support personnel of the clinical center who were there after 2014, who were never informed of these procedures that Dean Strample was supposed to inform everybody. And at the same time, we have a criminal investigation going on by the Ingham County Prosecutor's Office. The patient was concerned that I was inappropriately touching her and didn't understand why. You know, okay. like, like, you know, he was, you know, touching me in my private areas, you know, and she didn't understand why. And that's, those are two things that confuse me because I, I, I do this on a regular basis. This okay. is, this is a treatment that I, that I lecture on. I lecture on not only here at Michigan State to the fellows and residents and medical students, but to, um, uh, national organizations. Shouldn't a prosecuting attorney office bring in outside experts. You know whose experts they used? Michigan State University's experts that Larry Nasser handpicked. They believed the status of Larry Nasser. And once again, they also found that there was no sexual assault. And they sent one of the detectives over there to tell Larry, make sure in the future you have somebody in the room and you wear gloves and you explain what's going on. So 2014, you have all these restrictions were put in place. The assault should have stopped. They didn't. I was a patient of his before, during, and after that Title IX investigation, where protocol was put into place that I wasn't made aware of and then not followed. Nothing changed. You know, ex what happened during the visits was exactly the same from when she started seeing him in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. When did the incidents happen with Larry Nasser? Um, in 2014. They didn't have him follow the guidelines, and they didn't really put a stop to it until so many people came forward. Out of 90 of our survivors that we represent, 28 of them were assaulted during or after 2014 Title IX investigation of Amanda Thomas. But this is not just Michigan State University, it goes to organizations that span this country, USOC, USAG. Do we know when USAG knew about Larry Nassar's predilections? Well, we know for a fact it was 2015. Spring 2015, Maggie Nichols, a gymnast on the US national team, was at the Caroli Ranch for one of the monthly training camps and she was with Allie Raisman. And Maggie said out loud, what's with this technique he does? Like, why does he put his finger inside of me? I'm not sure it's helping. And Maggie Nichols' coach happened to be within earshot and was alarmed by this. There was a report made to USA Gymnastics. Steve Penny sat on it for a few weeks. USA Gymnastics former president, Steve Penny, was notified that a gymnast was assaulted at the national team camp. Why on earth did they not report him then? Maggie Nichols' mother was told by Steve Penny, don't do anything, don't report it. We're gonna handle this internally. We don't know yet if we need to report this. They waited for five weeks before they went to the FBI. Five weeks. When you have gymnasts telling you that Larry's doing these manipulations every day, sometimes twice a day, Five weeks is a long time to be sitting on the knowledge that Larry Nasser 
is, is a sexual predator. They waited five weeks because they did their own internal investigation as to whether or not this was sexual abuse or not. After an internal investigator told Steve Penny, you really have a problem here, you have to go to the FBI. Steve Penny called Scott Blackman, the chief executive of the US Olympic Committee. The Olympic Committee legally is responsible for the safety of the athletes at the Olympics. And Steve Penny said to Scott Blackman, something to the effect of, we have a member of our medical staff who's been accused of improper contact. I'm going to report it to the FBI. Scott Blackman has said to us that he told Steve Penny, definitely report this. And is that enough? Steve Penny did. I mean, that's a, that's a question. Of course, we want to say no, because of what happened in the subsequent year. No, he, nothing happened. The USOC had tremendous responsibility as the top of all of Olympic sports in the United States. And the USOC has had inadequate child protection policies for years. There's been a problem in gymnastics with sexual abuse and with physical abuse for decades. In 1999, the then president of USA Gymnastics, Bob Calarasi, wrote a letter to the USOC raising concerns about their method of handling allegations of abuses by coaches, saying the way the system works is going to get us in trouble. Scott Blackman was on that letter. They knew it, they knew they needed a better system, and they sat on their hands. Nasser, he actually was allowed to resign from USA Gymnastics and said he's taking his leave of absence and thanked them and left on his own terms. But Nasser is back in Michigan still treating patients. He continued to do that for more than a year after that in Michigan. What did USA Gymnastics tell Michigan State University? Oh, there's an investigation on? They didn't tell him. You know, there are many missed opportunities for people to be informed about this. And what nobody knew at USA Gymnastics was that the FBI never even opened an investigation. I mean, it went to the FBI in Indianapolis. The FBI in Indianapolis said, we're gonna kick this over to the Detroit office. And then it died there. The FBI in Indianapolis doesn't seem to have taken their allegations very seriously. We also don't know exactly what Steve Penny told them. MSU, USAG, USOC, Twistars, and the FBI, all these organizations, they knew. Every organization had a chance to stop. All that time, Nasser was still working at MSU. He was still working for Holt the school district that he was working for. He was treating people nonstop until Rachel Den Hollander came forward. Oh, sorry. I'm Andrew Munford. Hi, nice to meet you, Larry Nassar. Thanks for coming in so quick, too. Yeah. Obviously, you're not under arrest, so you can leave whenever you want. Um, I know you talked to Val O'Brien on one of my colleagues. Yeah, wow, right, right, yeah. right. I've been trying to adapt my techniques so we won't get into the same situation. Okay. Um, what practices have you changed in response to I've been to have, trying to have people in the room, okay. you know, um, and uh, uh, trying, obviously, not to get into that same situation. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, like, has there been another complaint? I'm just, like, confused right now. How long have you been doing this technique? I have video from 30 pounds ago, um, from, like, okay. <laughs> from, like, the 1990s. I'm trying to remember... Okay. It would have been in the 1990s, you know what I mean, like early yeah. 1990s. Right. Um, well, the reason I'm asking is that we did have another complaint. Really? Yeah. And um, it's a patient from a while ago. Okay. I was a patient of Dr. Nasser in 2000, and at age 15 was repeatedly sexually assaulted by him under the guise of medical treatment and medical examination. Rachel Den Hollander was not an Olympian, but um, an advanced level gymnast who, in the summer of 2016, became the first person to openly name Larry Nasser as an abuser. She was inspired to do this by a series that ran in the Indianapolis Star. There's a troubling report in USA Today Network and the Indianapolis Star, the governing body for American gymnastics, is accused of routinely protecting coaches who were accused of sexually abusing young athletes. Rachel Den Hollander read this article and she had been over the years coming to terms with this treatment that she had been subjected to by Larry Nasser more than a decade earlier, and she reached out to a reporter. Rachel Den Hollander told the Indianapolis Star newspaper that Nasser sexually assaulted her when she was 15 years old, taking part in club gymnastics in Michigan. 
Ultimately, one other former Olympian spoke anonymously in the original article and identified Larry as an abuser. When someone comes public and puts it in a major newspaper that this guy who was employed by your university um, sexually abused her, and you have two people talking about it, that carries a lot of weight. Two gymnasts have accused Dr. Larry Nasser of sexually abusing them during treatment. One of the women has filed a criminal complaint against Nasser with Michigan police. The other has filed a lawsuit in California. I read the headline and I laughed in disbelief. I was like, there is no way, like he is a saint. Cause at that point, even though I didn't like the treatments, I really thought that he had been helping me this whole time. I actually defended him at first cause I knew that, well, I was told that this was a valid medical procedure. And I was brainwashed and conditioned into to believing that for the past 20 years, in, I think in order to just survive through it. And so I defended him. Trené came home and we both just said, this cannot be. She's like, there's no way, it's Larry. It's Larry, if you know Larry, there's no way it can be Larry. And it actually made me mad. I was like, how dare you accuse such a kind person of doing such an extremely awful thing? Um, and I didn't read the article because I was in a dance rehearsal at college. But then when I was by myself after that rehearsal, I started reading through the article and Rachel Den Hollander had it to a T. She described my whole experience, weird commentary, no gloves, internal techniques, followed by his response that he never went internal ever. He would never do that. And I was like, his story is very different than my personal experience. I was so embarrassed when it start, first started coming out. I didn't want to say anything. I was like, how did I let this happen? How did I not know? The thing is, like, my whole life, like, I've trained to be smart as I can, as strong as I can, and as fearless as I can. And, like, in moments like that, where those things happen, I was none of those things. And to me, that was, like, soul-crushing. Over that night, my the gears started shifting in my head, realizing all this time for seven years of my life that I thought it was medical and helping me. And I literally walked around praising his name, referring people to him. Now I've been referring people to a monster. I started to have a heavy guilt about other people that had come to me when I was younger and saying, you know, I'm confused. Something happened to me, but you know, do you know anything about this? And I'm like, oh yeah, it happens to me all the time. He does it to me all the time. You're good. You don't have to worry, it's not weird. You're not the only one. He does it to me all the time, so you're good. And then thinking like, oh my God, like did I just silence these people? Like did I stop them from stopping him? I did. That's because you didn't know what it I was. Know. <laughs> but he still did. I called Indy Star and reported my story. And so obviously they knew Rachel well, and I got to talk with Rachel that first day that I found out. And she really spurred me on to keep going to the next steps. Things developed pretty quickly. Rachel Den Hollander filed her complaint at the end of August, and by the end of September, Larry Nasser had been fired from Michigan State. Michigan State University police say about 50 women have now come forward accusing the former MSU associate professor of criminal sexual conduct. Michigan State University Chief of Police Jim Dunlap and I are announcing today criminal charges. In November, he was charged by the Attorney General in Michigan on state sex abuse charges related to one victim who was not a gymnast he treated. The first time he got put in jail, he bailed himself out for a million dollars. He was a free citizen. He's walking around town, still trying to be um, part of the council for Holt High School. It's dividing the whole town. I had people I talked to on the phone, they couldn't even speak because they were best friends with Nassar's wife. The Twistars community is behind him 100%. And I have known him before he even went to medical school. 
and everything he's ever done for gymnastics and everything I've ever seen him do has been nothing but caring and sincere. There are hundreds of people that support him 100%. We have received countless emails okay, and communications from other doctors, physicians, physical therapists, ex-patients, ex-coworkers supporting him. There's no doubt he has a ton of support. I couldn't even go on Facebook because people from my childhood were saying things against me, essentially. Just decided to click on the comments. Oh, they're lying, or they're just in it for the money, or oh, they should have known that happened. There's all these weird emotions, you know, at the beginning of September 2016 until the porn stuff came out and then everyone silenced. An FBI agent saying they found at least 37,000 images and videos of child pornography on hard drives belonging to Dr. Larry Nasser. They were seized during a recent search of the former MSU doctor's home in Holt. I represented Dr. Nasser in his criminal matters in Michigan and in federal court. I believe law enforcement said there were 37,000 or more than 37,000 images. It sounds like a high volume to people who are not familiar with these cases, but in all honesty, it's not a high volume. It makes me want to vomit. Were some of those pictures, some of these gymnasts and some of his patients, some people that he saw in his house? Quite possibly so. I mean, I cared that that was found, but what I mostly cared about, that he was in prison without bail. Bond was revoked and Dr. Nasser was uh, locked up in jail. And so it became more difficult in terms of, you know, defending. There was no real way to mount a defense in the, in, with the child porn. I can't answer that. There was no more reasonable doubt about this anymore. And USA Gymnastics starts realizing this is not going to get better quickly. The U.S. Olympic Committee's board is recommending that USA Gymnastics President Steve Penny resign. Steve Penny lost his job, but he got a roughly $1 million payout. Then fall of 2017 was when the Harvey Weinstein allegations came out, and we we're in the, the full throes of the Me Too movement. Michaela Maroney, the gold medal Olympic gymnast. Maroney is now coming forward to say that she was abused by the former doctor for Team USA. Olympic gymnast Allie Raisman said she is among the young women sexually abused by a former physician with USA Gymnastics. Four-time Olympic gold medalist Simone Biles says she was sexually abused by a former USA Gymnastics team doctor. She posted about it on Twitter yesterday saying this, I am not afraid to tell my story anymore. These are some of the most cherished, celebrated athletes in America, in the world. And they're coming forward and saying, this also happened to me. We were also abused. And right under the noses of the US Olympic Committee, USA Gymnastics, and the American public. This was happening while we were competing for you in London. And before then, their public coming forward, I think the importance of that can't be overstated. The attorneys asked if I would take a plea, and I advised that's fine, but I'm going to let everybody talk because he harmed so many, not just the girls, but everybody who touches this case. Victims will be allowed to speak and will continue until all victims have had an opportunity. When the opportunity posed for us to do our impact statements, I was thankfully at a place where I knew that you don't need to be shameful because it wasn't your fault and you don't need to live in that darkness anymore. You know, the day of court, my alarm went off and I have never been in such a panic. Like, I felt like I was falling off a cliff when I woke up. There were so many people in there that were so heavily impacted by what happened. Every time a door opened, we were all, 
You know, like I felt that tension and I felt everyone's eyes go to the door immediately. The first victim will be publicly identified, Ms. Kyle Stevens. Good morning. Up until this point, I've been known as victim ZA, or family friend. I was the first to testify in this case, and wary of the attention that could come with that, I asked for complete anonymity. I'm addressing you publicly today as a final step and statement to myself that I have nothing to be ashamed of. My parents had become close friends with Larry and his wife, Stephanie. It was during this time, I estimate I was approximately six years old, that Larry Nassar began to sexually abuse me. He first exposed his penis to me in a dark boiler room in the basement of his home. He told me, if you ever want to see it, all you have to do is ask. Let me remind you of the interests of a six-year-old girl. My favorite TV show was Clifford the Big Red Dog, and my favorite book was Junie B. Jones. I could not do a multiplication problem and still had not lost all my baby teeth. Someone of this maturity level should not be sexually active, but I was. Without my knowledge or consent, I had engaged in my first sexual experience by kindergarten and had progressed from exposure to masturbating in front of me while playing hide and go seek, rubbing his bare penis on my bare feet and penetrating my vagina with his fingers. It took a friend confining the details of her sexual abuse for me to realize that something was wrong. I was 12 years old when I told my parents, when Larry rubs my feet, he uses his penis. My parents confronted him and he denied any such action. Due to complex details that I won't get into here, my parents chose to believe Larry Nassar over me. I spent the years between 12 and 18 avoiding and detaching from my family. To my father, Someone who makes such heinous, false accusations is the worst type of person. His belief that I had lied seeped into the foundation of our relationship. Every time we got into a fight, he would tell me, you need to apologize to Larry. It wasn't until I was about to leave for college that I took another chance at clearing my name. Larry Nassar's actions had already caused me significant anguish, but I hurt worse as I watched my father realize what he had put me through. My father and I did our best to patch up our tattered relationship before he committed suicide in 2016. It was very painful. You could see it in their face. People were shaking, crying, just at the sight of Nasser. I thought that training for the Olympics would be the hardest thing that I would ever have to do. But in fact, the hardest thing I've ever had to do is process that I'm a victim of Larry Nasser. As I listened, I started getting angry, which I didn't want to get angry. When the proceedings started, it was just like any other court hearing. And really what happened is every day there were more and more girls coming forward. The next survivor you will hear from is Amanda Tomashow. Lindsay Lucky, Jessica Smith, and she has agreed to be publicly identified. Normally, there are not people applauding. <laughs> people booing the defense lawyers. My office and my family were getting death threats. My co-counsel was getting death threats on his children. At times, I was very fearful of just the vulnerability coming out into fighting. It felt like you were really a part of a mob, and it was just adding like a constant fuel to a fire. It's almost like that kind of an explosion was inevitable. Gymnastics doctor who is admitted to sexually assaulting young girls, claiming it was medical treatment, back in court today. Judge, I would ask you to, as part of this sentencing, to grant me five minutes in a locked room with this <laughs> demon. Would you do that? I, that is not yes or no? No, sir. Would you give me one minute? <laughs> 
This morning, we had a delay because of a letter that was sent by defendant, and he states, I'm very concerned about my ability to be able to face witnesses this next four days mentally. The letter he wrote me was all about him, him wanting to be in control. Sir. There's a few sentences in here that concern me. Your letter states, now Aquilina is having a four day sentencing media circus. She wants me to sit in the witness box next to her for all four days. So the media cameras will be directed toward her. <laughs> And the portions I didn't want to read is because he's actually listed some names, victim blaming. I didn't want to read it and then black out the names because each girl is going to put their name in there. There's no good that's going to come from reading that whole letter, which is why I've sealed it. What was it like for you to consider if you wanted to read a statement in court? Um, at first I was kind of unsure just because of being in that courtroom and having to face the person who did all that stuff to me, but at the same time, I wanted to have a voice. He manipulated me so much that I didn't know what was going on. Larry acted as if he was a friend. He would greet me with a sickening smile every time I saw him. I remember him liking my posts on Instagram. It's weird to think that an older male doctor was liking a little girl's post and commenting Merry Christmas on Christmas morning. I started to get anxiety after seeing all the news reports about him. I felt like I couldn't breathe and I would tremble in fear. I have nightmares about what happened and have troubles with sleeping. I've been putting on anxiety pills just so I can function throughout the day. It's hard for me to trust people because of you. I get scared and uncomfortable when I have to go to the doctors. I get scared that I'll be taken advantage of once again by another doctor, just like you did. I've tried my best to gain back the strength I once had. I am a survivor. Here I am today facing my abuser. I'm finally being heard. I'm no longer hiding my story. When it first started, there were only about six who were actually going to come public with their name. One girl empowered the next, empowered the next. Your Honor, I didn't think I would be here today. I was scared and nervous. It wasn't until I started watching the impact statements from the other brave survivors that I realized I too needed to be here. I am also here to tell you to your face, Larry, that you have not taken gymnastics away from me. I love this sport and that love is stronger than the evil that resides in you and those who enabled you to hurt many people. Larry, you do realize now that we, this group of women you so heartlessly abused over such a long period of time are now a force and you are nothing. You hear these statements and you know, they're so brave. So I wanted them to know, one, I wanted the little ones to know that I was there for them because I was older and I do know him very well and I wanted them to know that I'll stand, I'll stand with them. If you will allow it, I would like to address him directly. You may. <laughs> wow. You're strong. What have you done? I look at these young girls here, and I told my mom the hardest part for me was to see how little they were. She said to me, you were that little too, if not younger. 
I had to make an extremely hard choice this week, Larry. I had to choose whether to continue supporting you through this or to support them, the girls. I choose them, Larry. I've known you basically all of my life. In fact, I've known you 31 of 37 years. I remember your wedding thinking Stephanie was the luckiest woman in the world. My heart hurts for her and the kids every single day. Why lose everything and everything that was good for what? We literally loved you like family because we thought you loved us back. I choose to look you in the face and tell you that you hurt us. You hurt me. As I've had to realize I was abused for many years of my life. And this, my old friend, is because of you. I don't know who you are now. Larry, I think you will be happy to know that I am 12 weeks pregnant today. It's a little boy. And I will do everything for the rest of my life to make sure that the youths of this world don't get to hurt another one of us. <laughs> Goodbye, Larry. It's time for me to close the door. <sighs> May God bless your dark, broken soul. Dinner, we are on our final victim impact statement. I am so honored to let you know that the next person you will hear from is Rachel Den Hollander. How much is a little girl worth? At 15, I believed that the adults at MSU surrounding Larry would do the right thing, and I was terribly wrong. You play word games, saying you didn't know because no one believed, because these teenagers didn't report it to the right official. And so I am asking point blank, when Kathy Collegius humiliated Larissa Boyce and waved the report form in front of her, telling her there would be consequences if she reported, is this the right way or the wrong way? When Amanda Tomashaw reported to the Title IX office and Larry was allowed to hand pick the four colleagues to determine whether his treatment was legitimate, was it the right way or the wrong way to handle a report of sexual assault on MSU's campus? No one wanted to listen. I ask that you hand on a sentence that tells us that what was done to us matters. Larry said in court that he hoped education and learning would happen this is what we need to learn. Look around the courtroom. Remember what you have witnessed these past seven days. And let it be a warning to us all. When the adults in authority do not respond properly to disclosures of sexual assault. When institutions create a culture where a predator can flourish unafraid. This is what it looks like. It looks like a courtroom full of survivors who carry deep wounds. Women and girls who carry scars that will never fully heal, but who have banded together to fight for themselves because no one else would do it. Women and girls who have made the choice to place the guilt and shame on the only person to whom it belongs, the abuser. But may the horror expressed in this courtroom over the last seven days be motivation for anyone and everyone no matter the context, to take responsibility if they have erred in protecting a child, to understand the incredible failures that led to this week, and to do it better the next time. Because everything is what these survivors are worth. Thank you. Thank you. You built an army of survivors, and you are a five-star general. <laughs> you made all of this happen. You made all of these voices matter. 
Thank you. Thank you. Larry wants to address the core as well. What would you like me to know? It's just a short statement. Um, your words these past several days, your words, your words, have had a significant emotional effect on myself and has shaken me to my core. I also recognize that what I am feeling pales in comparison to the pain, trauma, and emotional destruction that all of you are feeling. There are no words that can describe the depth and breadth of how sorry I am for what has occurred. He heard all the cries. So he turned around again and more and more girls started crying. And then the judge realized what he was doing. An acceptable apology. Sir, you need to stay at the microphone or they can't hear you. An acceptable apology to all of you is impossible to write and convey. I will carry your words with me for the rest of my days. But I do want to read some more of your letter. And the reason I want to do that is because I've considered it in sentencing as an, exten as an extension of your apology and whether I believe it or not. So I want you to hear your words. The media convinced them that everything I did was wrong and bad. They feel I broke their trust. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Oh. His letter fired me up so much. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I mean, he's not comprehending the damage that he has done. That line really says it all. He has no respect for women. I think it helped hearing that, actually, because I, there, there's been many times where I felt bad for him because we had this relationship with him. We, like, we really loved him, and looked up to him, and cared about him. And so it was good to hear those words that he wrote because it made me not feel bad for him anymore. Would you like to withdraw your plea? No, Your Honor. Because you are guilty, aren't you? Are you guilty, sir? I said my plea, exactly. It is my privilege to sentence you to 40 years, the tail end, because I need to send a message to the parole board. Sir, I'm giving you 175 years. I've just signed your death warrant. If I thought he was worthy of being rehabilitated, I would have sentenced him to the 25 years. Based on his comments to the girls, he was not remorseful. He is a true predator. That's all for the record. All right. I really expected to feel a lot better, if I'm being honest. I felt like I was gonna walk out and be like, great, things are better now. You know, when people are like, it's over, it's not over. While it was very empowering to watch these women, they're taking back their voice, but they shouldn't have ever had to use it to say, me too. Disclosing your name and your face along with your story in this volume to be believed is a travesty.
we need to deliver on the promise to these victims that the world will be better because you came forward. The Me Too movement will be a success if it turns into social and legal change. Is, Is there any truth that there's money been put aside for counseling for these girls? Yes. Have any of the girls been contacted yet? They were supposed no. to be. What about for those of us who have already had counseling, but this is now a year and a half later that you're doing this? The counseling fund, if you read the, the, the material that was released publicly. I would like to hear from you. Okay, Thank includes you. past expenses. is we have to start listening to our kids. If a child says to you they don't like how someone touched them, you don't say, but that's one of the nicest people I ever met. You sit down and you say, why? What was wrong? Would you let your daughter do gymnastics? I have mixed emotions. <laughs> I feel hopeful that Changes, positive changes are being made, so it will be a better sport for her eventually. The sport is beautiful. It's a wonderful sport. My child does it. I didn't yank him out just because of this. No, I felt empowered that, hey, the sport's going to be better for a future generation of children, right? Because we stood up and we did something about it, and we're actually being heard now. I would see like my old teammates posting and I'd see all these things about gymnastics and I really missed it and one day I told my mom that I really wanted to do it again. So that's where I'm at now. I was out. That looks good. Okay, I mean, you, why don't you try it? You try a couple and then if it needs to be moved, I'll have you move it. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. I did feel that I'm finally able to start my life again and not have to worry about him ever doing anything wrong again. 
and being back, I, I was able to build up that confidence I once had and I'm just able to do what I love.